Okay, if I can call meeting to order and welcome everyone to this, the 18th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2018. The first item on our agenda is the consideration of new petitions. The first petition is Petition 1708 on catering for vegans on all public sector menus. This petition was lodged by Matt Banahan on behalf of the Vegan Society and Go Vegan Scotland. I welcome Matt Banahan, Campaigns and Policy Officer of the Vegan Society, and Barbara Bolton, co-founder of Go Vegan Scotland, who will give evidence to the committee this morning. Welcome. Uh, you have an opportunity to provide a brief opening statement of up to no more than five minutes, please, after which we'll move to questions from the committee. Thank you very much for having us to speak to our petition. I'm Barbara Bolton. I'm from Go Vegan Scotland, but I'm also a solicitor and I specialise in vegan law. So I will speak to the human rights and equality position in relation to uh, vegan rights this morning. And Mark Banahan from the Vegan Society will then speak to tackling climate change and improving health. So vegans have legal protection under human rights and equality law because the vegan philosophy passes the test for a non-religious belief that is serious, cogent and worthy of respect. The vegan philosophy is essentially that because animals are alive in the same way that we are, we shouldn't use or kill them. The European Court of Human Rights has confirmed that that qualifies and that's been conceded by the UK government and acknowledged by the Scottish government and the Equality and Human Rights Commission. The protected status of veganism means that we have a right to live in a way that avoids using and killing animals or paying somebody else to do that for us and not to be discriminated against on account of our veganism. That applies in both the public and private spheres, but today we're focusing on the public sphere where there's an additional obligation to take positive steps to address inequality. Unfortunately, there's very little awareness about the rights of vegans, and we know this from many cases that have been reported to us by individuals, but to get a broader picture, we carried out a survey of Scottish vegans. Over 500 responded, and they highlighted systemic failure across the Scottish public sector, particularly in hospitals and schools, to provide for vegans. In many of our hospitals, vegans are not provided for at all, leaving vegan patients having to rely on family or friends to bring in food, having to discharge themselves before they're well enough to leave. And not everyone will have family or friends who can cater for them in that way, and many wards do not allow food to be brought in. Many examples were provided in response to our survey. The full results are available on the Go Vegan Scotland website, but examples include I was in for two weeks when my son was born and they said they couldn't cater for me. My partner had to bring in all my meals. I wasn't allowed to use their fridge or microwave. Another said a particular issue is that it's not possible to pre-book dietary requirements. Another said the chef at the hospital said he was under no obligation to provide for me. Scotland schools do not generally have meals that are suitable for vegans. Most have vegetarian options, but generally containing dairy or eggs or both. And even where vegan parents specifically request provision for their children, there are many instances where they are told there will be no provision, we don't have to provide for you. I was contacted just yesterday by a vegan mother living in Glasgow who's trying to get suitable food for her daughter in nursery. Glasgow City Council are basically refusing. Responses to our survey included, our local primary has vegetarian but not vegan options. In order to obtain other dietary requirements, you have to prove medical need. Another said, only vegan school dinner option is a dry baked potato. My children do not do school dinners for that reason. This means my youngest misses out on free school meals and is the only child taking a packed lunch. We've also learned that some food providers are under the impression that they cannot provide vegan meals in schools unless there is a requirement, a health requirement, and it's signed off by the NHS. So there's clearly a lot of misinformation, which is resulting in vegan children <coughs> being refused suitable food, including where they're entitled to free meals. Scottish government's position that it's up to local authorities is not good enough. When they are failing and refusing to provide the government has to take steps to ensure that there's consistent provision across the country and the proposed legislation would be the best way to achieve that. And Mark's now going to speak to the environmental and health benefits of the proposed legislation. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Barbara. So increasing vegan food provision will support environmental initiatives. The evidence is clear that animal agriculture causes significant harm to the environment in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, inefficiencies leading to extensive land and water usage, deforestation and eutrophication. In June this year, researchers from Oxford University conducted a landmark study which concluded that eating a vegan diet is the single biggest way that an individual can reduce their impact on the earth. In October, the IPCC report on climate change announced that we need to be aiming for a global temperature increase of no more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, rather than 2 degrees as previously thought. The report estimates that we have just 12 years in order to avert catastrophic temperature increases, so we really need to be doing everything in our power now to mitigate these temperature increases, which are caused by greenhouse gas emissions. Harvard research also shows that the livestock sector could use almost half of the 1.5 degree greenhouse gas emission budget allowed by 2030, so addressing this should be a key part of the strategy to hit climate targets. With a growing global and national population, it is clear that our diets will need to change in order to do this. The Scottish Government has made a number of commitments to tackling climate change, so by increasing availability and accessibility of vegan food, we hope that longer term diet choices will be more environmentally friendly and help in mitigating climate change. Not only this, but ensuring vegan food availability will improve public health. The British Dietetic Association recognises that totally plant-based diets are suitable for every age and life stage, including pregnant and breastfeeding women and young infants. In addition to this, there is now a considerable body of research that links vegan diets with lower blood pressure and cholesterol, as well as lower rates of heart disease, type 2 diabetes and some types of cancer. The UK is currently woefully short of meeting the recommended five portions of fruit and veg a day, with the average around three and a half portions a day, according to research. It's estimated that diet-related ill health costs the NHS 5.8 billion annually, more than smoking, alcohol or physical inactivity. Uh, businesses and the economy also suffer through missed work days due to sickness. Scotland currently has the highest overweight and obesity levels of any UK nation. Building familiarity with plant-based foods in public sector settings could help to address this and reduce long-term diet-related illnesses that currently put strain on the NHS. Children being exposed to vegan food in school at a young age begin to understand that meals do not need to include animal products. The Good Food Nation policy has as part of its aims that everyone in Scotland has ready access to the healthy and nutritious food they need and that dietary related diseases are in decline. It also aims to reduce the environmental impact of our food. This change would make a significant contribution towards achieving these admirable goals. So Scotland has the opportunity to take the lead in the UK and recognise the many benefits this change would bring to the growing number of Scottish vegans, to the environment and to public health. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that. We'll just maybe move on to questions now. You, you did mention and identified some of the issues in your survey, but you also said you, you presented the findings of the survey to the Scottish Government. Um, have you received a response from the Scottish Government to that, I mean, specifically to the survey as opposed to general issues, and how have they responded? Yes, their response has been that they recognise that veganism is a protected, non-religious, fundamental belief but that they believe that it's the responsibility of local authorities to address provision. And right. that's been it. So, but in regards to the health service, that, that wouldn't be the case, so what did they say about that? Well, I don't believe it would be the case in relation to the health service or education. I believe it's their responsibility to take steps, but they don't appear to accept that. Specifically around the findings in the survey around um, experience of hospitals, uh -huh. did they, what was the response to that? Their response has been... Uh, very limited. There was one letter and it simply stated that it's the responsibility of local authorities and they seem to approach it on the on the basis that it should be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. So you need so to they've not the looked at the survey then? It if doesn't the survey, appear the that they've looked at it. If the survey is dealing with not just what's happening in schools but in hospitals, to say it's a matter for local authorities self evident not it may not be the responsibility in their view of the health boards either, but to say it's the responsibility of local authorities simply to miss that point out altogether. I think that's right. I think that, that we've essentially been given the brush off up to this point, which is why we felt the need to bring the petition to, to air these issues. Ultimately, if, if nothing's done in terms of the human rights and equality issues, there will be claims. Claims will go to court. And we would rather avoid that because I don't think that's the right way to, the ideal way to resolve issues like this. 
Okay, thank you, Angus. <coughs> okay, thanks. Um, can we have good morning, Barbara? Good morning, Mark. Um, in the background information, uh, you, you state that the number of people choosing to live a vegan lifestyle has doubled uh, twice in, in the last four years. Um, and you, well, you can probably tell at first glance that, uh, that I'm not one of them. Um, but <laughs> stranger things have happened. Um, now, our, our, our briefing says that the, the Vegan Society estimates that there's currently around 600,000 vegans uh, in Great Britain. Um, I'm curious as to how you estimate those figures. And you, you also state that, um, and I quote, more people are choosing plant-based food for health, environmental and ethical reasons. Um, so I was wondering if you could point us towards the evidence uh, to support that statement. So the, the Vegan Society has done uh, independent polling with uh, Ipsos Mori, um, and, and that forms the basis of our figures. They, the, that figure is an estimate now, and we are going to be doing a more comprehensive survey in the coming year, 2019, to, to find out an accurate figure. Um, we do expect it to be higher than 600,000 now, um, because obviously there, there's been a huge increase in the last two years, and it's, it's showing no signs of stopping at the moment. So, yeah. Um, and there are a growing number of people now conscious, even though they may not be vegan, but they are consciously um, reducing their animal product consumption as well. So people may, may limit themselves to one day a week or, or take certain days of the week off. And they're also increasing demand for it. And, and so that also buoys demand for, for um, vegan food in the public sector as well. You can also add to that anecdotal evidence. So Go Vegan Scotland, we have vegan information stalls out on, on Scottish streets basically every week in Glasgow, Edinburgh, and in any towns that we can manage to, to reach. And increasingly over the last two years, we're approached by people who are already vegan. Um, we've noticed a marked difference in, in the number of people who are already living vegan in smaller, including in smaller towns. And for example, you can, you can see the growth of the plant-based food industry. For example, Kirkcaldy is today opening its first vegan venue. So vegan venues are popping up all over Scotland. We're not just talking about the major cities anymore, although Glasgow has many, uh, something like 17, and Edinburgh is rapidly catching up. So we're seeing uh, a real transformation in terms of the food industry as well. OK, thanks. Um, moving on to uh, the, the section in your petition that uh, talks about equality. Um, you've referred to the Equality Act 2010 in the petition, and uh, our briefing has also referred to the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, the Human Rights Act of 98 and the position of the UK Equality and Human Rights Commission. Uh, and a briefing also outlines some specific duties that have to be met by public bodies. So taking into account uh, that detail, can you give us your view on uh, um, how public sector bodies are meeting these requirements? I believe that they're currently failing. Uh, not in every case. So there are cases, and we did get some positive stories in response to our survey. So, for example, there are hospitals where they have a full vegan menu, and there are some hospitals who actually have the food on that menu. But there are many where they have the menu, in theory, but nobody really knows it exists. And if they have that a back and forth with the patient and they manage to, d to uncover the menu, they then discover that they don't actually have the food on the menu or they find a frozen meal that, that's been sitting in the freezer for however many months and, and they manage to, to pull that out. Um, but across the board, there, there is no consistent provision. And if you have a look at the full responses to our survey, you'll see that people refer to many different hospitals in, under various health boards across Scotland. So we're not just talking about isolated cases. Um, and in schools, the general position, as I say, is that there, is, there are no vegan meals in our Scottish schools. Some vegan parents have been successful. They've had um, very uh, open-minded and obliging schools or nurseries, and they've managed to get really good provision for their children. But the general situation is that, that it's completely lacking. And I think one of the important things in relation to schools uh, to remember is that vegan children don't necessarily come from affluent vegan families. And there's still a perception that vegans generally are, are affluent and are eating avocados for every meal, but that's really not the case. Vegans come from all walks of life, and many children make the moral decision to go vegan themselves and are the only vegan in their family. So it's not the case that 
you can assume that a vegan child is supported at home, that their parents can advocate for them, or that their parents can provide them with packed lunches when they should be getting free meals. Um, so to come back to your question, I believe that there is a systemic failure right now by, by in, in, in all Scot Scotland's uh, public institutions. Um, we haven't looked in detail at prisons, um, but there were responses that related to police custody and that type of thing. And so we're proposing that a vegan option should be available in, in all uh, state entities. Okay, thanks. Um, you, you mentioned health boards and uh, <coughs> the, the provision of vegan meals to varying degrees. Are, are there any health boards in Scotland that you know of that don't, um, de you know, definitely don't provide that service? I don't think it, it's broken down by health board. It's very specific to the hospital, and then it's specific to the ward, and then it's your luck as to who is actually on duty that day um, and what their level of awareness is. So it, it varies. Thanks. Okay. Uh, David Torrance. Thank you. Convener, good morning uh, to witnesses. As a member for Kirkcaldy, um, <laughs> we've just had a vegan restaurant open and a vegan coffee shop, and I attended the first vegan Christmas fair they've ever had. Um, for Small Business Saturday, and it was well attended. But what I'm interested in is your comments about the public sector recognising improvements that could be made and increased provision. Have you any examples that, that, have, that have done that? Um, there are like quite a few examples that the vegan society have got. Um, there are, uh, in Scotland, there are limited examples that, that we're aware of, but um, certainly in, in the wider UK, there are there are lots of um, hospitals, universities that we've, that we've contacted who have then um, decided to implement a full vegan menu, um, which, which the vegan society were sort of um, collaborating with, uh, with them to, to make. We've, we've got lots of resources that, that help um, that, that these institutions to, to make these changes. So we, we've got the services of a registered dietitian who's registered by the British Dietetic Association, who can help institutions make these um, these changes and come up with really uh, nu nutritious menus and um, like yeah meal plans that work over, over a week and a month to make sure that the institutions are, are providing re really healthy food for their um, vegan clients. One of the examples, is it not ang is it angry, in the, the caterer? Yeah, so we... Uh, often hospitals and schools are catered to by large companies that, that cater to, to multiple schools or hospitals. And we, we, uh, we worked with a company called uh, Anglia Crown um, and they developed a whole vegan range that they were then going to supply to uh, over 100 UK hospitals. Um, and, and, and we worked with them to, to uh, develop their vegan range. Um, and, now, and now they are providing that to over 100 UK hospitals. So it, it, it shows that, that these, these changes can be made quite easily and we're, we're more than happy to sort of work with people to, to make it as easy as possible. We have some examples of, of dishes that are on those menus uh, with us, so we can leave them with you. Thank yeah, you. yeah, we've got quite a few bits of resources we're happy to leave with you to, to have a look at to, to consider as well. So. Thank you. Um, Brian Whittle. Oh, thank you, Gavina. Uh, good morning. Can, can I start off just, just a bit of clarification around uh, what public sector institutions you're uh, talking about here? We talk about schools, hospitals, councils, prisons, but, and specifically... At what age are we proposing school children should have uh, access to, to vegan meals? At all ages. Okay. Uh. I think I think um, if I take that that perspective, it takes quite a lot of application, you know, consistent application to uh, maintain you know a, a, a healthy uh, a vegan diet, and uh, also to, to to make sure, especially for an ch activity children who are very active. Um, uh, in, in taking an, an intake of the sort of calorific value uh, can be quite difficult without uh, supplements under uh, how you would respond to that um, well so certainly not in terms of, of calories we we've got as I say we've got a dietitian who can who can provide um, meal plans which which would more than meet um, any child's age um, calorie intake um, the, the, the there is supplementation recommended around one uh, 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 nutrient, which is B12, um, but I mean, we would recommend that schools would have that available as well if they were uh, providing vegan food. Um, but it's certainly, in terms of in terms of calorie intake, there, there's there's no real concerns there. We can provide um, menus that that have more than enough calories for for a, for a growing child. So yeah. 
Just to add to that, I think there's a lot of misconception about the vegan diet and its sufficiency generally. Mm. Um, for example, you know, the Germany's strongest man, Patrick Baboumian, is, is totally plant-based and he has no difficulty getting the calories he needs to um, create the, the huge muscles that he has. So, and there are people at the top end of most sports now who mm -hmm. are living plant-based and thriving. There is no uh, difficulty in terms of ensuring that you get sufficient I, this is a red light, is that? You're, I'm on, you can hear me, yeah. There's no difficulty in terms of getting the calories we need. Um, and as Mark says, the only supplement that, that's really essential is B12, but that's really essential for everybody now because mm. that comes from the soil and, and that's really depleted, so we're all lacking in that. I think that, uh, you know, having come from that, that basis myself um, and looked at uh, and had access to to some of the top uh, dietitians in the world, it is quite. My, my point is, it, it, it's not impossible, but it's quite difficult, and you have to be. You have to have that consistent application. Uh, and you're talking about this, this, this. Uh, you know, at, at the top end of sport, this gentleman in, in, in Germany. But for a five-year-old to to, have to to be able to be able to follow that that that, that kind of pattern, you know, that that would be my concern. I think what we're looking at here is. So sort of the for that level, the sort of the vegan diet. I think that uh, the knowledge of a vegan diet uh, uh, within the public sector, within hospitals and schools, etc., probably, for my money, wouldn't be good enough at the moment to be able to ensure, you know, that that consistent nutrition uh, for for our children. So yeah, we we would like to see um, a lot more work done around education as well, increasing awareness of this. And, and that probably applies not just to vegan diets, but to, to nutrition in general. So I think that's something that is, is certainly lacking um, in, in, in education, the sort of knowledge of how you get all your, your vitamins and, and, uh, and minerals. Um, but yeah, so I mean, if, if the, the, I don't think there's any sort of danger that if we increased people's knowledge of, okay, so you need to be looking to get, uh, over a week, you need to be trying to get quite a lot of this type of food and this type of food in order to, to meet your uh, nutrient requirements. If we, if we increased knowledge and then also increased the um, availability of vegan food, I, I, I don't see that being a problem. I mean, there, there is also obviously a danger that, that children uh, are becoming obese um, at the moment and, that, and that, is a, that is a real issue that is happening. Um, and I mean, that's not from, from eating vegan food, is it? That's, that's from eating the current offering that is being provided either at school and at home. So, so one of the things that a, a vegan diet can sort of uh, help with is things like heart disease, um, type two diabetes. The, the, these are things that if, if children are, you know, they've, they've got the knowledge of what nutrients they need to get and they're eating a lot of fruit and vegetables, these, these are, these are long-term sort of health gains that, that could be uh, certainly beneficial to, to Scotland's public health. Yeah, I would currently be more concerned that children are not getting enough fibre uh, than anything else. But also, our schools have nutritional requirements in relation to school meals, and any meals will have to satisfy those requirements. I think, I think one of the things is don't, don't conf conflate the fact that people are eating a lot of really bad food <laughs> to become a piece rather than eating, it, rather than eating the, the healthy food. I think that... Uh, Having at one time in my life I had to eat four and a half thousand calories a day, and, and looked at this in, in great depth, um, I think I think you know my, my perception of it is that it's, it, it can be quite difficult to to uh, intake that amount of calories in the uh, in a healthy way. So I think the only thing I'm thinking of is, is that that uh, if, if children are on a are, are completely vegan. Um, do they, you know, do they have that kind of knowledge to have that consistent application to to stick to a vegan diet? That's Unfortunately, fair. we don't have a dietitian here with us today. I don't think anybody around the table has any qualification in in nutrition or dietetics. So probably the best thing for us to do is provide you with the information afterwards, because obviously this has been looked at in depth. Uh, the Vegan Society has mm -hmm. been around since the 1970s and has been looking in detail at this. 1940s. Uh, sorry, it became a charity in the 70s, been around since the 40s. Um, so, you know, we're, we're not speaking from a, a platform of no knowledge of, of the nutrition and dietetics uh, position on this. Um, anything else you want to say on that? 
Um, yeah, I mean, we we can certainly yeah, give you some more more detailed stuff on, around the nutrition directly from a, a dietitian who's registered by the British Dietetic Association. Um, I mean, the, the British Dietetic Association do say as well that, that it is suitable for all ages and life stages, which includes young infants as well. So, I mean, if 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 schools have implemented a, a meal plan, a vegan meal plan, that that over over the course of a week, a month, like covers off absolutely everything, there would be no sort of danger from from a child eating that food every day. And so, yeah, remember the second point I wanted to make. Um, it sounds as if you're approaching this on the basis that if we make this food available, children will go vegan. But it's, it's the other way around. Children are already vegan. They've already made the decision, I don't want to eat animals. I don't want animals to be killed for me. And they're not being given food. So what's a child in that situation supposed to do? Just not eat, is essentially so, what we're I'm, saying I'm, to them. So I'm, so I'm, not, I'm, not taking, I'm just taking it from a pure, purely pers pure perspective of ensuring that... Um, Children get the proper proper nutrition. That's that's where I'm coming from. And uh, uh, and my, my position is, you know, I want children to be more active. I want them to eat a lot more healthy. I'm certainly not against you know vegan diet. Uh, I'm just coming from the position of of uh, ensuring that uh, the knowledge is out there. I think the the, pop, the the problem I have here is that um, in taking evidence, the NHS have said exactly what I've said around the, the, the difficulty in, in maintaining that sort of health and nutrition. Uh, they have, they've come from that position. So that's they also recognise that a vegan diet is, is entirely sufficient as long as you're eating the right things. Yeah. You also find that vegan parents tend to be much more knowledgeable about nutrition than non-vegan parents because of the lack of general information, because of the misinformation that's out there. From the very point where someone becomes pregnant, they know that they're going to be quizzed about what they're feeding their children. And so they, they really, really know their stuff. Um, and so, you know, if the, if the vegan child is within a vegan family, then they're going to be getting all of that support at home. Okay, thank you. Can I just ask a couple of quick, brief questions before I bring in uh, Rachel? The first vegan I knew, it was for, um, I might say medical reasons, she was dairy intolerant. What proportion of vegans are in those circumstances? Because for them, it's not an option to have another diet, and I wonder whether that has been a, a subset of issues for vegans. I just want to clarify one thing, and then I'll let Mark speak to the figures, because the Vegan Society has the figures. Um, the vegan term is used as a shorthand for plant-based food, because that's just handy, and we all do it, and we're all online, and you need short words. But I think it's important to clarify that veganism is about it's not just about food it's not just a diet it's recognizing that animals are alive and you don't want them to be killed for you so you don't eat them you don't wear their skin you don't use them for entertainment you don't buy animals you don't use things that have been tested on animals and that's a vegan that's somebody who's living their life in a way that recognizes that animals are alive recognizes animal rights essentially um, Every vegan is plant-based, they follow a plant-based diet because by default, if you're not eating animals, you are plant-based. But not everyone who follows a plant-based diet is vegan. So there are a lot of people who don't eat animal products for various reasons. Like you say, they might have dietary um, requirements or it might be for religious reasons. They may be abstaining from animal products because they recognize that's very important for the environment. But if they're not living their lives in a way that avoids exploiting and killing animals altogether in all these other ways, then I wouldn't say they're vegan, I'd say they're plant-based. But we use the vegan term very broadly. They may call themselves vegan. Yes, a lot of people do that. Um, a lot of people are not aware of the history of veganism. Um, but I think if we look back to the roots of it, to the 40s, uh, we see that it's really about animal rights and it's been a social justice movement throughout that time. And so the fact that it's been somewhat co-opted by the plant-based industries as well um, and diluted by that. I think for the purposes of the equality and human rights position, we have to remember what, what veganism really is. But in terms of the figures... Um, yeah, thanks, Barbara. Um, in fact, I don't actually have that particular figure um, in terms of how many people uh, are vegan due to, say, dairy intolerance. Um, you consider them vegan anyway, so perhaps um, when. <laughs> We we would consider that they were eating a vegan diet, um, and 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 
and what this petition is about is is providing vegan food in in public sector settings so they they would also need um vegan food in order to, to be provided for we do we do know that, that most people go vegan for ethical reasons but there are now a considerable number of people who decide to, to eat vegan for environmental or, or, he or health reasons as well okay. so that, that 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 um those sort of areas are increasing in so them. so barbara you spoke about misunderstanding and misinformation which are obviously two different things um, you said there's, there's so much misunderstanding and misinformation. To what extent do you think the lack of provision is misunderstanding? And to what extent is it misinformation and perhaps hostility to veganism? I would say it mostly stems from misunderstanding what veganism is and misinformation in terms of the rights of vegans. So they kind of go hand in hand. I think most people believe that veganism is about diet many many people still believe that it's just a personal choice if you think it's just a diet then i can understand why if somebody's in hospital you might think to yourself well just put your diet to one side and eat what we give you you're in hospital this is the nhs it's publicly funded you know just suck it up but if people understand that it's not a diet that actually that person is someone who has lived and is doing their absolute best to avoid animal exploitation and killing and that to suggest to them that they eat something that's been taken from an animal who's been used and or killed for them, you know, is equivalent to trying to get somebody to do something that's against any other fundamental conviction, religious or non-religious. Then I think there might be more understanding. Um, but there's also just a lack of awareness that vegans have these rights and have to be catered for in the same way as you would cater for somebody who had uh, a certain religious belief. Okay. Don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. No, no, that's fine. Thanks. Rachel? I, I think we're sort of getting diluting the argument slightly here because if somebody walked into um, um, an NHS setting wearing leather shoes and actually asking for vegan food, then are you going to deny those people that food because of choice and human rights? So I think in this sense, I think we should um, get back to um, the situation where it's about choice because. I, I believe that you're confusing your argument about the definition of veganism um, in terms of plant-based, but I mean, you can defend that in a minute. Um, we are in a situation at the moment where um, many um, private sector um, um, restaurants and many um, public sector organisations are having to offer various diets, allergen-free, gluten-free, kosher, halal. When I was the South of Scotland, uh, regional MSP, I went to Dumfries Prison where um, there were varying um, diets being offered um, and they were talking to me about the, the cost of that. Um, I, I agree that there, there should be choice but if we, if we look at it from the perspective of um, what is the barrier currently in Scotland, if it's working in NHS trusts in England, you talked about, um, you talked about Anglia Crown and their plant-based um, diet being um, delivered to over 100 NHS trusts. What really is the barrier um, and what, what did the NHS trusts do in England to make that transition um, to change um, their policy and to take into account perhaps the financial obligations that um, would come with having a more um, expensive plant-based diet and what did they do uh, in order to train um, the catering staff or to um, um, upskill them in terms of offering um, different dishes such as stir fries or quinoa or plant based um, meals? <clears throat> um, okay, so first of all, on the sort of cost implications of this, so it actually doesn't have to cost uh, any more, it can actually be cheaper. Um, I know they were speaking to I was speaking yesterday to Mark Ruskell, uh, MSP, um, and he was he was telling me about a, a school in in his area that has um, decided to do a, a meat free Monday, um, and they actually found that it was considerably cheaper to do this. Obviously, meat is actually quite expensive when you compare it to fruit, vegetables, pulses, grains, things like that, um, and that they've actually managed then to use the savings to um, try and, and and buy some really l local produce as well to sort of you know. Um, increase their sustainability credentials um, and so yeah so we that there is an, another um, place where, where this has actually been done they have this law in Portugal since last year 
Um, and we've been speaking to the Portuguese Vegetarian Society who sort of campaigned to, to get that law in place in Portugal. And they found that vegan options can actually be up to 40% cheaper than the non-vegan alternatives. So in, in the long run, they're finding that their institutions are actually saving money by, by um, offering a lot more vegan food. So it, it sort of, it, uh, most people sort of believe the opposite, that it would cost a lot more to do this, but we're, we're finding that it actually it wouldn't do. Uh, it would actually be quite cheaper. Um, we don't have any data yet for any of the hospitals that have decided to, to offer more vegan food. Um, a lot of these are, are really recent, um, but we're hopefully doing a bit of work next year to try and get some, some UK uh, applicable data for that as well. Um, in terms of training and, and um, upskilling, as you said, um, again, a lot of these, these changes have been made quite recently, so I, I haven't had a chance to, to sort of go back and revisit some of these, um, but that's certainly information that, that we can get if you, if you want me to um, submit um, to, to the committee um, following this meeting. So th thank you, Mark. Um, I think that uh, it would be really useful because a lot of um, NHS uh, boards currently um, actually produce meals on site. Um, not, not everyone uses, um, you know, large companies who deliver the meals to those sites. It would be very interesting to know Basically, has there been a cost increase? Has there been a, a cost decrease? How many NHS trusts in Scotland are currently using um, organisations that are able to deliver um, within their budgets the uh, vegan option or a plant-based uh, diet? Yeah. Okay. Um, is that something that you might want to ask ourselves if that's something that's, you know, like if we, you know, asking across the board of um, NHS boards what their approach is, it might be something that we can do rather than asking you to, I mean, whatever information you have would be useful to the committee, yeah. but rather than perhaps that sounds like quite a large exercise, that's might something that we could perhaps pursue. <laughs> that would be very helpful. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, also in, in terms of long-term costs, um, we, we, we sort of believe that if there were more vegan food being served, in, in certainly in places like hospitals and schools, that that would have a long-term cost-saving implication to the NHS in general. So we say it's about, around about £5.8 billion pounds in the UK is um, uh, attributed to um, poor poor diet. Um, if we can sort of, on, on the long-term, like um, increase people's ability to make better, healthy um, diet choices, then, then obviously those costs could decrease as well. So... Rather than just being a very short term, oh, we've had to change a menu here, that costs us a bit more. We're thinking long term as well. So, Just to come back to the first part of your question there, um, just to clarify, you know, when we make a distinction between the plant-based diet and living vegan, that's not in any way to try and suggest that people who follow a plant-based diet shouldn't be respected or that people who have dietary requirements shouldn't be provided for the they clearly should and the benefits in terms of this proposal for the environment and health apply if because of the plant-based uh, aspect the rights and human rights the equality and human rights um, arguments that are put forward they flow from the right to freedom of thought conscience and belief uh, religious and non-religious and the test for that and who gets protection is there's quite a detailed list of requirements. And the vegan philosophy that I outlined, um, whereby you avoid you, the use or exploitation of animals altogether, has been found by the European Court of Human Rights to, to qualify. And that's what's been recognised by the Equality Commission. And so that's why I think it's important just to understand what that is and where those protections arise from. So, and also there, there's been decisions by the um, Employment Appeals Tribunal recognising that somebody who lives their life in a certain way because they have a fundamental belief that, that that's necessary to protect our environment because of climate change, and that includes a plant-based diet, that's been recognised also as protected under uh, freedom of thought, conscience and belief. So it's not to segregate plant-based from vegan um, to create confusion or, or difficulties around this, but it's just to clarify that we've got the rights aspect, and so these people under law should be provided for, and that we're currently failing to do that, but then we've got the wider benefits of plant-based eating uh, itself. Okay, so finally, just on that point, uh, 
what is, why do we need to um, sort of uh, make this law in order to do this? Why can't we just do it from the base of choice and the base of um, nutrition and uh, with it within you know public sector? Why why do you have to go down this route? That's what I'm trying to get at. Okay, well, in the private sector, I mean, there are still issues, but it's um, to some extent taken care of itself because there you've got supply and demand, and demand has gone up, and supply is rising to meet that. But in the public sector, it doesn't work like that. And um, when you go into hospital, whether you know you're going in in advance or not, you, you can't make arrangements in advance. You have to just go in and, and see what they have. And as I, as I outlined earlier, we are hearing from people all across Scotland that in many hospitals, many wards, there are many instances of people being told we just don't have anything for you. And so, as I say, they're having to rely on friends and family. In some cases, nurses are trying to be really helpful and nip down to a shop to bring them something back. I mean, that's not, uh, I wouldn't think, the inclusive uh, approach that we want to have in Scotland. I would think we want to be able to cater for people who, who need a decent meal after an operation or because they've had difficulties with their childbirth or whatever it happens to be. In school, as I say, we have heard from many people telling us that even when they go to the school and they explain why their child needs um, these meals to be provided that don't include animal products, they are being told, we will not provide for you. And that's happening frequently. And as I said, somebody contacted me just yesterday and she's a vegan mother, she's trying to bring her daughter up vegan, and she's getting pushback from Glasgow City Council telling her that they simply won't provide. And that's at nursery level, but um, based on the information we're getting from across the country, she may well experience those same issues when her child goes into primary school. So I believe that this, the, we clearly have a situation where allowing this to be addressed in the moment, on a case-by-case -case basis, is not working. Um, we should recognise our obligations. We should also recognise the huge benefits of, of bringing this in across the board and face up to it and take a bold step, uh, just as Portugal did not long ago. So Portugal all, has... All due respect, Rebecca, Rebecca Barbara, um, do you have enough substantive evidence to suggest that all... Uh, local authorities are not addressing that situation. You've used examples of Glasgow City Council, but you know, I think there needs to be some more substantive evidence to suggest that those local authorities are not um, committing or are pushing back on um, delivering that choice. I would very much like to see um, a statement from each local authority, each health board, telling us what, what the current situation is with their provision of plant-based food, because I think that would be very interesting. And we're just a voluntary outfit, so you know we haven't had the resources to, to investigate this to that extent as of yet. But you know, obviously I'm aware of the Freedom of Information Act and, and we can take those steps if we need to, but um, you know, that information should be available. And, and so that would be useful to, to see. Thank you. Yeah. So I'd, I'd like to agree with, with what Barbara said there um, and also say that so yeah, w what we would like to see is either a piece of independent legislation that, that, that covers off what we're saying or maybe as part of a wider bill like for example the Good Food Nation bill if that could be um, if what we're asking for could be a part of that that would, that would also be um, sort of uh, sufficient for us I don't know whether um, I know there's going to be a consultation very soon on this. Um, I don't know whether we could try and get, um, as part of the consultation, um, questions around what we're asking for in there to try and, and, and sort of um, get, get, other, get other stakeholders' views on that and, and to sort of bring that into the conversation as to, as to how, the, how that bill is shaped. Although there's been a very long lead-in to the Good Food Nation Bill and there's real uncertainty as to where that's going to end up and so I wouldn't like to see this kicked into the long grass either. And I think this is something that could be done uh, as a standalone measure much more quickly. Uh, Angus MacDonald. OK, thanks. Um, just on the Good Food Nation Bill, um, there's some comments here at this end of the table that's been dropped, but uh, as I understand it, it's going to be included in the, a new agriculture bill. But I could be wrong. Um, if um, I'm aware of time constraints, uh, convener, so if I could just quickly go back to the, the climate change aspect, 
uh, that Mark brought up, um, I, I wouldn't like to close the evidence session without uh, looking a bit more at the IPCC report. Um, now, you'll know that uh, the Scottish Government has been pressured uh, into putting a zero emissions target into the, the climate change bill that's currently going through Parliament. Um, NGOs and, and opposition, some opposition parties are, are calling for zero emissions, and that's clearly a tall order, uh, but we do have to get there, uh, whether it's by 2050 or, or not. Um, now, Mark, you, you mentioned um, the IPCC report, which gave us all a, a wake-up call, particularly th those of us focused in here on uh, climate change. Um, and the report states that there's increasing agreement that overall emissions from food systems could be reduced by targeting the demand for meat and other livestock products, particularly where consumption is higher than suggested by human health guidelines. Adjusting diets to meet nutritional targets could bring large co-benefits through greenhouse gas mitigation and improvements in the overall efficiency of food systems. So I was, just for the record, I was keen to, for, for you to expand a bit more on that, um, mm. if you could. Um, yeah, so the, there's, it's not just the IPCC report. There's there's new reports all the time. There was a, a report last month from a um, Harvard fellow, Dr. Helen Harwatt, that uh, basically says that <clears throat> on current um, uh, projections, the uh, uh, the livestock industry would use up to 50% of the allocated uh, greenhouse gas emissions budget by 2030. Uh, which would lead to unrealistic uh, um, um, emissions reduction targets in other sectors. So if we don't sort of address this, it, it, this it, it, there's basically no way that we could ever meet the, the one and a half degree targets. Um, I mean, in terms of demand as well, it's um, uh, it, it sort of um, uh, de so, sorry, sorry, um, it. Um, adds to deforestation, certainly in places like the, the Amazon rainforest, where forests are not only cleared for grazing, but also to, to grow crops, which are then fed to animals, which obviously is a very inefficient way of getting um, energy from crops rather than just eating the crops directly. Um, uh, there's, there's many, many other, uh, other uh, areas as well, like eutrophication, um, soil erosion as well, des desertification, and these probably don't, don't affect Scotland in some way, but the, but the demand for, for the meat is affecting other areas as well. Um, so, um, yeah, so um, an average cow produces around 700 litres of methane a day, which is equivalent to the emissions produced by a 4x4 travelling 35 miles a day. Obviously, methane is a far more potent greenhouse gas than, than carbon dioxide as well. So even if you, you've got a, um, a free-range pasture-fed um, cow that is still causing significant damage to to the environment. So, we we really do need to, to change our diets. I mean, diets are changing, but but not not at a, a rate that's going to be enough to, to meet the, the the targets that the Scottish government have have committed to. Okay, that's that's fine. Thanks. Can I just ask one last wee point on? You mentioned Portuguese have changed the law. My understanding is that legislation does offer an, an opt out, so that you would. If there weren't demand, then you would need to provide. Is that something you'd envisage in legislation? So that it's more about, well, within schools, where there is a request for, you make provision, or do you think it would be more generalised than that? So the, the Portuguese law means that they uh, all, all public sector institutions do have to offer a vegan option. The, the opt-out is only in very rare cases where they can, they can demonstrate that there is zero demand. Um, so I, d I don't... I don't envision that, that that would be a good way to go in, in this circumstance, m maybe in very, very limited cases if you've got a school of, of ten, 10 children, maybe if it was that small then it, they could maybe demonstrate that there was zero demand. But I think there are benefits from offering it on menus anyway, as I've sort of outlined in terms of um, building familiarity with plant-based foods, so that would in the longer term lead to uh, more environmentally friendly and healthier long-term diet choices. So. I, I don't think it's a good idea to, to set out on this route uh, already with ex exemptions in mind. I think that only in, in very, very specific um, circumstances that, that that would be a, a good thing to, to include. But you did mention it in the private sector. I mean, I, I think probably my sense is that younger people are more likely to be vegan than older people, or it's something, and it's something the private sector is responding to. 
so it's responding to demand. Would that not seem not same thing happen in the public sector that where there was demand, the issue is that you seem to be identifying there's demand, but the local authorities are refusing to meet that demand, or the health authorities are refusing to meet that demand. That makes sense rather than creating a provision before you, the level of demand has been identified. I think the level of demand is there and it is growing all the time as well. So our, our data suggests that 40% um, of vegans are uh, aged between 15 and 35. So we, we do think that there is, it's definitely skewed towards the younger generations. Obviously, so that, that indicates that the numbers are going to only going to rise over coming years. Um, so, I mean, there is already problems as Barbara's identified. Um, and those problems are only going to increase unless the public sector does something about it now and makes, and makes a, a change, which is why we're, we're asking for this change. Okay. Thanks very much for that. I think we've probably spent slightly longer than that than I'd expected, but thank you very much um, for, you, for your evidence. I think it's given us plenty to think about. So in terms of how we take this forward, I think we'd want to explore some of these issues further without necessarily thinking that, that solution is the one that the committee would support. I think we would be interested in get more information. I wonder if my colleagues have suggestions of what we might do. Brian? Uh, thank you, Kavina. You, as you're aware, I have a, a big interest in, in the, the health and diet um, generally. Um, I think there's a general lack of, of understanding, or, or a falling lack of understanding of what constitutes uh, a healthy diet, um, um, vegan, vegan included within that. Um, I think that, that, that my concern around it, around this is around the education system and, and you know, I believe that education is, is the main part of all the solutions. So what's, what, what interests me is that um, councils and uh, and uh, the NHS Trust, etc., have, um, to a great degree, have access to the Central Excel procurement contract. And that's where they get a lot of, a, a lot of their, a lot of their meals uh, are sourced from. So it'd be, would it not be a, a, an idea to to write to the Excel contract, the, the procurement contract themselves, and ask them how they cater mm -hmm. for uh, various, various diets, including uh, including vegan? Because it's it's through them that a lot of the councils and a lot of the the NHS trusts actually source uh, source the food. Well, it'd be interesting to know how difficult or easy it would be for them to meet demand. If you know, if a hospital say we can't do that, is it because they won't do it or they can't do it? Was it quite interesting? I think we should probably be writing to health boards and to local authorities, perhaps via COSLA, in the first instance, to ask is this something that they're even that they're actively looking at? Because if there's anecdotal evidence, I'm sure it must be developing a pattern within certain um, areas and I think to try to the Scottish Government. I would be interested in getting some clarity on what's happened to the Good Food Nation Bill. Mm -hmm. If it's going to be included, as you say, in the provisions of another bill, will they be consulting specifically around um, ensuring people's sort of not just health eating choices, but sort of philosophical choices, I suppose, um, would be, are being met and are they looking at that? Um, Vina to um, highlight to all these uh, people that we're going to write to about had they considered um, the financial implication of choice and it's not not to take away from this petition in particular but it's also to in in this instance to define what choice is being given so is is there um, a, a chance for people to have gluten-free food is there a chance to, for people to have um, halal and kosher food because at the end of the day, it's about meeting the uh, demand of a, a huge um, group of people with different needs um, and different dietary requirements. And I think that we're going, if we, if we, of course, this petition is about focusing on veganism. However, um, this is just going to throw itself up in terms of how, uh, because being a restaurant owner myself, I know the demands and I know the trends and I know that you know we're having to make changes through exactly what you talked about which is supply and demand and um, lifestyle choices so therefore it it throws up a whole new um, scenario for local authorities and um, NHS boards. I, suppose, I mean um, I was taught a very long time ago when it was entirely legitimate simply to provide what children would eat so they wanted chips so they got chips well you don't get chips now in a lot of schools they actively engage and don't offer the choices that young people want you know routinely you would have had um, 
vending machines in schools, you don't have them anymore. So clearly local authorities under, already understand that they have a public health responsibility. And I just wonder whether they see this in terms of um, veganism. Is it something that they've even looked at? So I suppose I would be interested in that. And at the level of <clears throat> where in schools in particular, or maybe in hospitals, where the food has been offered on site, to what extent is the training and understanding amongst you know, catering staff themselves? Yeah. Because you know, there will be schools, I mean, I'm not quite sure of the structure of it, but they must have somebody who's responsible for identifying dietary, mm -hmm. and getting all of that balanced out, and cost and provision and what demand is and so on. You know, I don't know whether it would be through the unions that the, the work in the public sector you know, that work in providing food in hospitals and schools, whether they would have a view on it. But I think it'd be quite interesting, even if that conversation is taking place. Because it does feel odd to me that you can go into big branches of restaurants, franchises in the, in the high street, and they will offer very detailed range of choices in vegan meals, but if somebody goes into hospital, they're told, we don't do that. But it feels as if the public sector is a bit behind the, the curve. I just um, one last point from me, convener. Um, the uh, Scottish government had published a healthier future Scotland's diet and healthy weight delivery plan, um, and they are going to um, produce relevant guidance by 2020. And I think it's important that we um, hone in on what the Scottish government have done or are doing to address um, this situation of a plant-based diet or a vegan diet or other diets within that. Um, one of the things, again, the benefit of being very old, it would not have been considered even a matter for a school um, meals provision to understand people's faith needs in terms of diet. And that's something that's changed over a long period of time. The idea that you know you would have a vegetarian option or halal meat or whatever in the past would not have been considered. So this is a, somewhere along that journey already. And I suppose the question we're asking is to what extent um, veganism is now even is it on is it on the radar for for organisations? It'd be interesting to find that out. Is there anything else we could do, Angus? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think it's always good to lead by example. So I, I think we should contact the Scottish Parliament's corporate body um, to see um, what uh, their stance is on it. I mean, obviously we've got uh, caterers um, in here who, who have award, uh, been awarded the. Healthy Living Award and the Healthy Living Award Plus, um, which which is good news. And of course, there's there's vegetarian and vegan options available mm -hmm. here. But it'd be good just to see yeah. what the okay. SPCB stance is on it. Okay, so I think that we've given ourselves quite a bit of um, information gathering to take, and we will look at the the official report just to clarify the kind of issues that, that Rachel was seeking. Obviously, if you get information, you can provide it to us. But it maybe um, it would. Um, the substance of that would be some questions that we would be asking of local authorities and others. That everything. Okay, in that case, can I thank you very much for your attendance today, um, for your evidence, and obviously we will uh, be in contact with you once we get a response. You'll be able to make a further response to to the ongoing conversation we're having with those who have. Um, we've gone to highlight the issues that are raised in the petition. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Can I suspend just briefly?
I can call the meeting back to order. I okay, can now move on to the next petition for consideration, which is Petition 1710 by Edward Archer on Community Hospital and Council Care Home Services in Scotland. This petition calls for a review of the provision of services for the elderly and long-term sick in community and cottage hospitals, as well as council care homes across Scotland. Members have a copy of the petition and a briefing prepared by Spice and the Clarks. That briefing discusses the various changes to government policy in this area, dating back to 2005 in the Scottish Executive's National Framework for Service Change in the NHS. The briefing outlines the various policy and legislative changes in the intervening years and covers issues such as integration of health and social care provision, specialist care provision, reductions in hospital beds and residential care, and costs to authorities of care for older people. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action on this petition. I am concerned about the delayed discharge currently, and I think that obviously the Scottish Government are taking steps to uh, minimise um, the amount of time that particularly elderly patients are kept in um, the hospital setting. Um, I, I do think that centralising um, some of the um, healthcare pathways have been detrimental, and um, I think it's really important that um, you know, the community hospital setting has what it's done and what it provided um, and it, it it gives people um, it gives people uh, a way of staying out of hospital and it offers so much more um, the, than um, you know than we think and I just think that it should be reconsidered by the Scottish Government and I think there should be some work done around and around this and I, I think that the petitioner um, makes good arguments Right. Uh, I think that this, this is something that's been, that's been um, investigated quite in depth by uh, the Health Support Committee. I've done quite a lot of work around this, and I think, uh, in fact, in general, it's very topical at the moment, obviously because of uh, the, this this desire to move from sort of the secondary care into the primary care setting. Um, it would be interesting to understand the capacity issue. I mean, there's definitely a capacity issue around that, which is which is leading to, you know, as I said, the, the the delayed discharge. So it would be quite interesting to 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 uh, um, uh, to write to the Scottish government and just get their their feeling on how the uh, that 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 change from some secondary to primary setting is is uh, is uh, is going and how they're how they're going to make make up the shortfall because that that in essence is is the biggest issue around that you know the the, the IGB model how the uh, the council and the NHS are, are working together. And I think you'll find as well that uh, there's quite a difference across the country depending on which local authority you happen to be in. There's there's there's, there's a there's been quite a disparity. We've 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 been uh, interviewing uh, quite a lot the, the health boards and some are doing it extremely well. I have to say it, it, it tends to be those in rural communities that are doing it particularly well as opposed to urban. So it would be quite interesting then maybe to, 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 to draw to draw that out, that particular Why do you think they're doing better in rural rather than urban? Because uh, in terms of the, the, the integrated joint bosses, because they've always had to do that because of, <laughs> because of geography, they've actually had to have that integration approach uh, uh, in, in, in rural settings because of the distances, etc. It's just out of necessity. They're doing better than, than, than urban at the moment. So I think it would be quite interesting to, to draw that out, but... I mean, ultimately, there's, there's, there's a lot of cross uh, reference here with, with mm. what the work of the Health and Sport Committee are doing. I mean, what struck me was, I think there is a kind of a trade-off between having a local provision but centralising it and being more specialist and being more successful. That's entirely logical. Don't keep people unnecessarily in the hospital. Get them out as soon as possible. But I know in Glasgow there's some very good examples of like step-down provisions, so they come out of... The hospital, but they go into a care setting which is funded by the health board to prepare them for going, going home. But I am very concerned that the idea that it's better for somebody to be in their own home rather than to be an institution, I suppose is absolutely true. However, if being in your own home means that somebody comes and sees you for 15 minutes in the morning, comes to see you for 15 minutes at night, gets you up far too early or puts you to bed far too early, that doesn't feel to me like any kind of existence at all. And I think home-based care or local care works if the care package is substantial, but where care packages have been reduced because of costs, 
I have heard people who are the strongest of advocates for self-directed support for the autonomy of the person who have argued that they can see the logic of having smaller units of people coming together because at least they've got a bit of community that the provision is, is more caring than you know the 15 minute the 15 minute even if it's a 15 minute visit so i think my sense from this is perhaps some of this is suggesting is there a community hospital uh, cottage hospital setting which is almost like the step down and um, if that's what the petitioner's thinking about i think that's certainly interesting but it's almost as if the reality is a quite there's quite a gap between the philosophy around joint boards and the reality in our communities. And I suppose some, I'd be quite interested in exploring some of that. Angus? Um, well, <coughs> I'd, I'd be keen to explore the uh, rethinking in, in specialist care as well. I mean, clearly there's some tensions existing in the system, given uh, there's uh, an ambition to centralise a number of acute services to particular hospitals. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd be keen to get further information on that uh, from the government. Okay. Also, there's this kind of generalisation that, uh, especially in, in, in the elderly population, they often come out of hospital worse than they went in. You know, um, I, I, you know. So um, the, the, the need to to uh, you know make that that journey through hospital as quickly as possible um, is, is uh, I think, it's highlighted in within the particular petition. Um, the petition. But it's going to end. It's still going to end up going. What are the, what's the service provision uh, that the councils have um, in, in conjunction with with the, the NHS? And I think we'll find, as I said, as, as the Health and Sport Committee have found, that 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 level of that, that level of, of, of care is is quite patchy. And that inquiry with the health committee is that ongoing? Uh, it is. Uh, IGB. Well, IGBs uh, take up a big chunk of our time, as you might imagine, because it's the big ticket item at the moment. So it'll be worth our while asking these questions, perhaps, of the Scottish Government um, about the reaction to the petition and at a later stage reflecting whether this is something we would want to feed into the Health Committee. Yeah. David? Well, I'd, I'd also be interested in why this um, strategy that was produced in 2006, shifting the balance, was was it shelved? Was it um, was it continued? Um, I mean, where where did it go? Um, I'm not quite sure. My sense is that that's that's the same sort of in terms of policy <coughs> terms. That agenda is the same, which is to specialise, um, to centralise acute services, but to take as many people out of acute services as possible by having local support services and working out what can be done at a local level and what can be done at more specialist level. And the whole acute service review was also without, um, not without its challenges when it went through. But I think philosophically, we're, we're still, the uh, integrated joint boards are really the same thing, that idea that there's a kind of a continuation or a continuum of support that's required and we don't want MD inappropriately in the wrong bit of it. My question is, to what extent in the middle of all this have we left people you know, they're contained in their own homes, they're not sustained there, they're, they're there, but if that's a better choice than being in, a, in a, um, a nursing home, I'm not sure if it is, where there's no, you're not meeting people, you're not seeing people during the day and those kind of things, but I think these are maybe simply questions we could be asking rather than having come to any conclusion. So if we're agreed and we write to Scottish Government to seek its views and the action called for in the petition, do we want at this stage to be writing to anybody else or will we leave it at that first of all? Okay, okay, so we'll go, we understand that there are broader questions around the, the role of health boards and integrated joint boards and local authorities, but we may maybe come to that at a later stage. And we would want to um, thank the, the petitioner very much um, for submitting the petition, and we will, of course, be in conversation with him once the responses have been received. If we can then move on to the next petition for consideration, which is petition 1712, by Laura Hunter on soul and conscience letters. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to review the use of soul and conscience letters in criminal proceedings and to produce guidance for the courts and GP practices on the use of these letters, including alternatives to court appearances if an accused person is deemed unfit to attend in person. We have some background information in our briefing papers which explains that a soul and conscience letter is essentially a letter from a doctor 
which excuses someone from attending court due to ill health or injury. Solon conscience letters can be used for both accused persons and witnesses. However, the petitioner seems more concerned about the use of letters for accused persons. Particularly, she is concerned that a trial can be discontinued if the health of an accused person is a factor. The decision to discontinue a trial is one to be made by the prosecutor. The petitioner states that, quote, the court should have the discretion to disregard any Solon conscience letter which it finds unsatisfactory which would suggest that she has doubts that the courts are able or willing to do this. She also suggests that doctors do not have a good enough understanding of what they have been asked to do and its implications. In this respect, she is looking for the Scottish Government to review any current guidance for the courts and GP practices on the use of these letters. A copy of the Scottish Court's guidance note is at Annex A in the briefing note. The Crown Prosecution Service note is at Annex B. Alongside the review of the use and guidance of soul and conscience letters, the petitioner also suggests that courts could consider alternative methods of bringing accused persons to court, for example, providing evidence via video link. The notes we have point out the provision in the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995, which generally provides that no part of a trial shall take place out with the presence of the accused. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action on this petition. Brian. Uh. To, to me, to me, this, the, what, what, I think what, uh, if I'm reading this correctly, what the, the petitioner look, uh, is, is looking at here is, uh, is abuse of the system or, or working the system. And you know, I'm, I'm sure we've all we're all aware of, of uh, instances where um, court proceedings uh, have been delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed by uh, this particular um, uh, this particular issue. That, that seem to be uh, an abuse of the system. So uh, I, have, I have a lot of sympathy for what the, uh, what the petitioner is, 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 uh, is saying here, and I wondered whether, uh, in, this, in this instance, we straight to Scottish government, you know, and, and just just to get their views on this, um, Crown Office, Procurator Fiscal, just to get their the, get their views on on where the current system stands, and and perhaps where that, that you know. In the, the minority of cases, that, that abuse of the system is, you know, or working the system, is, is, is evident. Okay, thanks, Angus. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> um, I think we should thank the petitioner, Laura Hunter, for bringing this to the, the committee's attention. I mean, she raises a, a valid point, uh, which uh, I must admit uh, I hadn't considered up until now. And um, in her uh, background uh, information that she provided in the the submission, um, she does mention um, that an accused person could provide evidence via video link or the GP being asked to attend court on behalf of the accused to give evidence on why the accused is unable to attend their court appearance. Uh, and I think these are fairly uh, valid points. Um, but I'd certainly be keen to hear from the Scottish Government as to their view um, before we uh, proceed with the petition any further. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Far be it from me <laughs> to, to disagree with Mr. McDonald. The, the one bit in there that, 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 that makes me slightly uncomfortable is asking the GP to turn to turn up at the turn up at court because they have quite a big workload yeah, as it is at the moment. Indeed, but it would help to concentrate minds, I would think. Yeah. Well, I suppose one of the things we might want to write to do is, is to write to the GPs. Um, representatives and say, is this an issue? I think it's a general issue for GPs having to write letters and do assessments and so on. Um, can a, a GP feel pressurised into providing this kind of letter? Um, and if they thought they were going to end up in court, having to justify it, they may not. But So maybe it's look, looking at it um, from the other side. I suppose I also thought there was a distinction, well, the two distinctions. One is the difference between something being delayed and being discontinued because somebody's not well. Um, I, I was quite surprised that that would be the case, but I think you know, the, the abuse of the system is one of the things that we, we might, want, might want to identify. And I would also be interested to know from the people who know the legal situation better than me. I think it says that um, a, a hearing shouldn't be, what was it? The, 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 the trial can't take place out with the presence of the accused. Does that mean a video link would be defined in that way? Because we've already accepted that for vulnerable witnesses or whomsoever, and indeed, um, simply in terms of convenience, you will hear that people will plead 
um, by video link from prison or whatever. So I suppose I'd be interested in, in the, the legal terms around that or something could be um, raised in that question. But I actually thought, you know, that it raises a, a series of questions. It's not whether it does feel to me to be entirely reasonable if you're not fit to, to come to court, you can't be compelled to come. But if not being well means that a case is then abandoned, I think that, would, from the point of view of a victim, that would be a concern. Rachel? Oh, I think that clearly GPs will be um, operating in good faith over this, and um, it's what they see at the time. And um, they're being asked to do so many things now um, to... To, for example, with um, gun licensing and all sorts of things um, to verify that person's um, state of mental health and, and so many things that they're having pressure put upon them. And I, I don't think that, you know, it, as, as Angus said, it, he hadn't necessarily thought about the whole process here. Um, I do get letters um, from constituents who um, have... Uh, are frustrated because they can't take a case to court because of this particular situation. Um, but I think there's a distinction between the process with the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal and the situation with the GPs. So getting that balance absolutely right and ensuring that those people are taken to trial is is really important, but it, they're two quite um, distinctively different things from assessing somebody's um, health at the time. Um, in order to be able to go to court. The observation I've certainly anecdotal evidence that GPs themselves have described in the past feeling pressured into giving somebody a note say they're unfit for work. Mm -hmm. For example, um, would this would is this the kind of thing that they feel they're under pressure on? Or people who have said they've gone to the GP and the GP have said, say for example they're looking for a, a house because the house is not fit. Some GPs will write a note, very sympathetic, not others won't. So there's actually a, is there somebody who won't, can't get a GP to confirm that they're not well enough to go to court as well? So I think the role of the GP in this and their perception of it would be interesting to establish. But also the, the significance of these letters in the understanding of the legal system, I'm quite interested in. Because um, if, you, if, a, if a trial can't go ahead without the accused being present, um, how do you prevent or is there an issue? Do the, does the Law Society or whomsoever think there's an issue around the way in which these may be abused. So I think there's, it's not to suggest that there, there is a major problem here, but I think it would be worth establishing how robust the procedures are. Yeah. Yep. So we're, we're writing to the Scottish Government, the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service, um, the BMA, and I don't know if there is a specific list, there is a group for GPs, it might be quite interesting to write to them directly. And so, maybe to the Law Society, yeah. just to their observations. Can I just ask? About the alternative um, methods, uh, would it be the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal who would be able to advise on if they had looked into alternative um, methods of um, uh, going forward with co court proceedings? Well, I suppose, it, I, I mean, I'm sure historically there were resistance to video links as well. Um, and you know, there was also sort of resistance to the idea that some should not be able to just simply to represent themselves, for example, in rape cases. But it would be good to get an understanding of what the, what the understanding of the profession and who it is that would make that decision. Um, what are the options? Okay. So if that's agreed, um, we would want to thank the petitioner, Laura Hunter, um, for raising um, the issues, issues she has done in the petition. I think that's quite an number of areas we'd want to explore with the relevant bodies. So thank you for that. If we can now move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the consideration of continued petitions. The next petition for consideration is petition 1540 by Douglas Filland on a permanent solution to A83. We return to this petition, which the committee last considered in December 2016. At that time, the then Minister for Transport and the Islands had outlined a programme of engagement and consultation which would include work on the issue of the A83 as part of the National Transport Strategy. It was indicated at the time that work on the strategy was to culminate in 2018. In bringing the petition back before the Committee for Consideration, it is noted that there have been further landslips on the A83, resulting in further disruption to road users. This is despite some mitigation work having taken place. The most recent disruption was in October. Following the scale of that landslide, 
The Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity, Michael Matheson, said, and I quote, I have asked Transport Scotland officials to review the current programme of mitigation measures with a view to further improving the resilience of the road and report back to me in early 2019. We understand that the Cabinet Secretary convened a meeting of the A83 Task Force in November 2018 for local and regional stakeholders to have the opportunity to discuss the recent incident and wider issues. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. David. Thank you, Convener. As a member of the Public Petitions Committee in the last session, we um, visited the rest and be thank you to see the measures that have been put in, the catch fences and the improvements to Old Military Road. But, um, in October there, what was it, over 3,000 tonnes of debris was caught by a catch fences and it was still managed to get to Old Military Road. And the A93 is a vital link in that area, and especially economic benefits. So I'd maybe suggest that we write to the Transport Minister and see what updates he's had from Transport Scotland. Angus? Yes, thanks, <coughs> Convener. Um, uh, in doing so, I think we should um, get some clarification uh, on the Cabinet Secretary's comments following the October landslip, where he said that, uh, uh, and I quote, we're also working closely with the Forestry Commission Scotland to, to reintroduce vegetation on the hillside to help reduce the risk of landslips. Um, so I'd be keen to hear from the Scottish Government what the timeline is for the planting of uh, any trees or, or vegetation, because uh, like uh, David Torrance, I was, I was on the Petitions Committee when this came in at first, um, and you know, one of the solutions was planting trees, you know, to secure the the soil. Um, and of course, the petition came in in 2014, and the trees still aren't planted. So um, I'd be keen to get a timeline on that. Okay, Brian. I think I was just just noting that the uh, the, the the national transport strategy that's currently uh, underway uh, just now is not really due until the end of this Parliament. Yeah, so um, when, when, you know, I'll be keen to just to, to explore whether you know whether the, the government are considering this outside of that, uh, um, because uh, that would be before any work was 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 done. We're probably looking at three years down the line, uh, which in this particular instance uh, is probably uh, well is going to be too long. And as long as it doesn't take away from the A seventy 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 five, I'm completely up for it. <laughs> <laughs> We're not, we're not having a priority list on roads. <laughs> but although, and, although interest, I do think that the same argument pertains around this is not just a transport issue, it's not just an issue of safety, but it is actually about the economy, the local economy, and it's very significant for that p part of um, Argyllshire if, the, you know, if, the, if there's a road blocked and the, the level of inconvenience for people when they have to take a detour is quite massive. Angus? Yeah, thanks. Um, for letting me come back in, uh, it's probably worth noting, um, and probably not much consolation to the people who rely on the road in Argyll, but um, it looks like the, from, from, from the Cabinet Secretary's comments, um, the preventative work that they've, that they've undertaken so far uh, helped stop the road being closed for at least 40 days. So, um, you know, Given, given the, the the work that's been done already, there have there have been benefits to it, but you know, clearly not enough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there is a sense in which there was some progress. It's frustrating that then, clearly, there was another landslide after that. So, this issue around forestation has becomes even more important, I guess, if there was identified mitigation, which has not now been pursued or has not yet been pursued. Um, it'd be interesting to know why. Yeah. Rachel, at what point? Um, might this become something that's um, prioritised? Um, you know, the, the consultation, the the meeting of the the task force, um, the the recommendations that have been put in place. You know, at, at what point do we really say, right, enough is enough? Um, you know, we need Transport Scotland absolutely have to put this to the top of the list and and do something about it. And if not. What is it that's blocking the decisions that have already, already made? So I think we're agreeing to write to Scottish Government asking for an, um, an update on the consultation and the review of the National Transport Strategy and where the H3 fits into that and whether the issues around it could be extrapolated, taken out from the strategy. I think it's the point that Brian's making. So it's not just like a long, long-term thing that's recognised and this is um, immediate. 
the whole question of mitigation and um, forestation, what's happened in relation to that, um, and to get an update from the meeting of the 83 Task Force November 2018, I think would also be useful. Is there anything else? No, in that case, if, if, if that's agreed, again, we're recognising that this is a long-standing issue for the Public Petitions Committee, and um, clearly a great deal has already been done, but there are um, clearly some challenges remaining, and I think the emphasis of um, the petition on a permanent solution to the 83 is not lost on, on the committee. So, with that, can we move on then um, to the next petition, uh, the next continued petition for consideration, which is Petition 1642 by Norma Austin Hart on the sale and marketing of energy drinks to under 16s. The committee considered the petition in September and noted that the UK government had launched a consultation in August seeking views on whether the sale of energy drinks to children should be stopped. The committee agreed to write to the Scottish Government asking whether it had any plans to consult on the same terms in which the UK Government is consulting and to keep the petition open until a response has been received. The Scottish Government has now responded to say that it intends to hold its consultation in the spring of 2019. The Scottish Government states that, quote, the UK Government consultation does not explicitly seek the views of young people and therefore it will commit to some bespoke engagement with young people in Scotland to seek their views. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Brian? Um, <coughs> yeah, I think, you know, obviously, firstly, I thank the petitioner for bringing this in. I think it's a, a, it links into so many of the, the work that's been currently been done with, within the Parliament around uh, health. And, and although, generally speaking, I, I, I would, I would, I'm uncomfortable trying to, f you know, legislate and force people into. Um, uh, behaviour in this particular instance, I think that uh, it's becoming quite endemic, and uh, and I think it's becoming a particular problem. And, it's, and I think it's it's good to see the Scottish government are actually going to you know are going to um, delve into this, and and, uh, and I think especially from the input from the, this committee as well at that point. And so given that they are that the Scottish government are, are uh, doing such a, a, an in depth uh, study of this, I think it's probably we're at a point now where we can do. Uh, not much more, so potentially uh, closing the, this petition uh, okay. uh, uh, would be... Uh, other views just that, like to put on, I'd like to put on record, convener, that I'd like to thank Norma Hart for bringing it uh, to the attention of the Public Petitions Committee as well, because it was very timely, because um, I had a situation with a head teacher in the borders talking exactly about this and the disruption that it was making within the classroom and uh, the issues that um, the teachers had with cr controlling children who had been drinking um, high-level caffeine drinks and uh, it's just so important and I just hope that you know with the Scottish Government uh, consultation launching next spring I think it's really important that this is um, you know not drag doesn't drag on and that the UK government and the Scottish government work very much together to um, address this serious issue. Okay. I certainly am very pleased that they've wanted to consult with, with young people on the question. They've taken on the seriousness of the of the petition. It feels to me that um, it, it would be appropriate for us to close the petition, recognise the progress that's been made, urge the petitioner, obviously, and others with any interest in this question to participate in the consultation and encourage young people they know to do so, and that if the, the progress stalls for any reason, it may be the petitioner would want to return. Um, Angus, are you have you? No, I'm, I'm, uh, I agree with uh, the comments made so far. Okay. So we're agreed then that we do we recognise the progress made, um, that we're closing the petition under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders, on the basis that the Scottish Government does intend to consult on the issue of restricting the sale of energy drinks and, as I already said, to encourage um, um, the petitioner to participate in this consultation. And if that's agreed, we'd want to uh, thank Norm Austin Hart very much for bringing the petition to the committee and recognising it's an issue that's um, beyond a very local issue. I think it's something that's a concern shared about that. What, you know, what um, the response to that then looks like um, is for another day, perhaps, but we'd want to thank her for raising what has been recognised as an important issue. With that, we'd agree to close that petition. If we can now move on to the next petition, petition for consideration, which is Petition 1671 on the sale and use of glue traps. This petition was lodged by Lisa Harvey and Andrea Goddard on behalf of Let's Get Mad for Wildlife. 
Since our previous consideration of this petition in April, when we took evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, we have received two submissions from the petitioners, and these are included in our meetings papers. The first submission, dated 27th of August 2018, reflects principally on the Cabinet Secretary's evidence. The petitioners appear broadly to welcome the Cabinet Secretary's evidence, although they do, they do outline some remaining concerns, not least the position that glue traps cause unacceptable, unnecessary suffering. The petitioners offer some suggestions as to how the Scottish Government might work with a range of agencies, including in New Zealand, with a view to developing future policy in this area, to agree a revised code of conduct and restrict the sale of glue traps to certified pest controllers only. In their second submission, dated 20 September 2018, the petitions, petitioners offer detailed back, feedback and suggestions on the current Pest Management Alliance Code or best practice for the humane use of rodent glue boards. The Pest Management Alliance has acknowledged the petitioners' comments and feedback and has indicated that, that it will look at the potential of a redraft of the current code of practice in that context. It adds that it will be willing to present any revised code to the committee for future, future consideration. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. Rachel? Thank you, convener. Obviously, animal welfare is um, you know, a, a, a very big part of um, a politician's uh, kind of consideration these days and a very, very important issue. And I, I think that because the Cabinet Secretary um, had suggested that the Scottish Government might approve an existing industry code of practice um, as produced by the, the Pest Management Alliance, that, that we do take evidence from them to actually understand a little bit more about how that code of practice um, might work here in Scotland. Anyone else? I suppose I, would be inter I am interested in exploring why they just can't simply be banned. Because I think, you know, the Cabinet Secretary did say, well, it would be difficult and there were certain circumstances. So I'm quite interested in what those circumstances are and what the protections are. So, because the, the kind of concerns that were highlighted about the impact of glue traps on small birds or whatever was something I think that we all found very distressing. So, I suppose what I want to explore is. Um, is there a suggestion, well, it's too complicated to do something different, or since we don't have to find another solution, we're not going to look for one? But I'm, I do think that the, 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 the fact that the, the Pest Management Alliance are willing to review their guidance and to come to the committee, I find that yeah. useful, and we should, we should recognise that they do want to engage with that conversation too. Is that agreed? Yeah. So in that case, we're agreeing to invite the Pest Management Alliance to provide evidence at a future meeting in early 2019, um, and obviously, if there are further submissions from the petition petitioners, we will obviously take them um, as part of our evidence as well. So, if that's agreed, if we can then move on to the final petition for consideration uh, this morning, is Petition 1683 by Jennifer Edmonston on support for families with multiple births. At our previous consideration of this petition in June, we agreed to write to the Cabinet Secretary for Social Security and Older People and the Minister for Children and Young People. The Clerk's note summarises submissions received from the Cabinet Secretary and Minister and notes that these submissions are broadly welcomed by the petitioner and TAMBA. TAMBA welcomes the Scottish Government's consultation proposals into the Best Start Grant and the Minister's example of how payments would be expected to be made under the Best Start Grant and the Sure Start Maternity Grant. Both the Cabinet Secretary and Minister outline measures that the Scottish Government is considering and taking forward within legislation, co legislative competence and remit, with the Cabinet Secretary in particular referring to, quote, complex and detailed discussions that would be required to be held with HMRC to develop regulations for topping up benefits. The Minister for Children and Young People refers to the trial of the Deposit Guarantee Scheme. That trial will run until the 21st of December 2019. Therefore, she adds that the information gathered from the trial will be analysed thereafter. Sorry, she adds that the information gathered from the trial will be analysed further to inform how the scheme will be rolled out in the future. At the moment, I note that there is no firm indication of when the full analysis will be available, but we have to assume it will be at some point in 2020. Tamba indicates that they look forward to the review of the scheme, although the petitioner sounds a note of caution, what she refers to as quote a large gap between the ages of zero and three. And I wonder if members have any comments or suggestions for action. 
Rachel? I'm really interested in, um, obviously, the, the devolved, um, newly devolved benefits through the Scotland Act 2016. What, so um, the Cabinet Secretary has said that HMRC, uh, there could be issues um, with, with doing that um, and that any such reforms in this area would require further legislation. I'm really interested in finding out um, the specifics of that um, and what HMRC would need to be able to do to, to get to that point. So um, where we get that information from, I'm not sure whether it's Scottish Government or whether it's from HMRC. Um, I think that it would be a, a valid point to, to write to both of them. Brian? No, I mean, uh, the, 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 this, this one here that exercised my mind quite a lot. I think that uh, one of the things that, that, that strikes me, uh, cause we, uh, as you know, this is quite a, a hot potato, if I can put it that way, um, uh, a political hot potato in this particular respect. But, you know, that aside, the, the idea of, 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 in terms of family planning and financial planning for family planning and, and then having the surprise of having a, a, a multiple birth and what, what and the, the different connotations of doing that um, it's definitely something that I think we need we need to look at I think I'd, I'd be interested to know what provision would be made under those circumstances uh, both from the UK government and what the Scottish government can do um, or, or, or how we can inform the Scottish government as it comes uh, comes up with its own uh, system um, how we can inform them, at least bring this uh, this particular uh, issue to the to the attention of uh, one informing the Scottish government as it deliber deliber deliberates on its own um, welfare plan, and two to, uh, to ask the UK government what, what provision it has made under its uh, uh, under the current legislation for that, um, because it's obviously you know multiple births is not not something that I particularly plan for, but can have a huge impact obviously on the finances of the family. Well, interesting. We were out just uh, door knocking locally very shortly after this petition was heard the last time, and met um, a young mum who had just had twins. And the, the point she made was, you don't really understand the impact. I mean, I don't think any of us understand the impact of a new baby in house anyway. But if it's more than one, the actual disproportionate impact in terms of cost, which is very difficult to plan and prepare for. And, and I suppose the question is whether it's just. Is it just the, the, the you know, social security system we're looking at? Are there broadly things that what are the implications for multiple births all the way, all the way through? But they're very practical things, and I suppose we would be asking um, government to look at that. I don't know whether we we agreed it before to write to um, children's organisations about whether this was an issue, for example, for Homestart or whatever who support um, young families, whether it was something that that they were aware of too. I suppose it's once you accept that there's an issue, then you have to almost like proof your policy. So, for example, if you have twins, do you get two baby boxes or do you get what a twin baby box, which would make more sense? So you're not getting a duplication of some things, but perhaps extra of other things that you you would need if it's a multiple birth. So I I'm, I I am interested in a broader understanding of how we could be supportive of these families, which maybe goes beyond. I think there are things, what is the UK government doing, what is the Scottish government doing, but the argument that oh, it's all very complex and the HMRC might be involved is a kind of a def defence through the ages anyway on a whole range of policy areas, but I think it's more looking at it, how do we seek proactively to understand its impact and what supports you can give families that everybody would sign up for. Brian. I think if we take it on from that, logically, I mean, the, the, the numbers are not big. Um, I think practically we can work out quite simply uh, the costs and requirements uh, of those individuals. And I think, and then think if we can, if we can you know, tease that out, it's then, you know, saying to, to both the Scottish Government and the UK Government, how are you going to deal with that? Because there are, I mean, there are, I mean, I think we could probably sit around here for 10 minutes <laughs> and come up with a, a decent plan. It's, it's how, how we get, uh, you know, legislation uh, put forward that the, or, or, or adjustments to current legislation that would take those practicalities into account. Okay. Anyone else? I think we're agreeing that this is an important petition. We recognise it's perhaps, you know, I think at the time of the, the petition first being presented, we were very struck by the evidence that was given. So we are wanting to write to the UK government and to the Scottish government about 
um, both the, the very specifics around the connection between um, change in the benefits and implications for HMRC, but other ways in which they both feel that um, the families with uh, multiple births can be better supported, and we would want then maybe to review that. And if there are people have suggestions of you know um, third sector organisations or others who might have a view on this that we could perhaps raise with them just to get a better understanding of it, or or there maybe their views of how we might address it. I think that would also be useful. Is that agreed? What your comments there about the uh, not just the financial implications but the practical uh, implications as well and uh, you're quite right it is difficult to get back to work with just uh, one child and um, not not just uh, multiple births as well and so perhaps some of the aspects of employment law um, you know need to be kind of reviewed on, on the basis of um, those women who are having multiple births. Yeah. Absolutely, and maybe some kind of policy change that understands it might stagger start to get back um, might help. I should say that, in fact, Homestat have already given a submission in this, so we can we further look at, at that. But I think we're agreeing that it's an issue that um, is important, and it's not necessarily big-ticket issues that would sort or help families. That's some very practical things that could be done as well. So um, if that's agreed... Um, we've reached the end of our agenda and want to thank you for your attendance and I'll close the meeting.